Hello, this is Maxine Engel bringing another Out and About with Max program. You good viewers know what hockey is. It's a game when two opposing teams of players attempt to drive a small object through opposite goals by hitting it with a curved or hooked stick. That sounds very simple, doesn't it? But to say the least, it does take stamina, determination, and concentration to accomplish that feat. My guest today is Lou Nanny. He is somebody that knows everything there is to know about the game of hockey. He's been a hockey player, a coach, general manager of the Minnesota North Stars, and even after retiring, he has stayed a part of the game and supported it in many, many ways. Lou will tell us about his career. Jude Drouin draws Andre Savard. Back to Lou Nanny, score! A nice level view as Nanny Slapshot sails over Gilbert's glove hand and the North Stars tie it up at 4-4. Would you believe four goals in one minute and 35 seconds? A defensive duel. This program is based on a radio interview I did years ago with Lou Nanny. Combining that with the talent of Liz Marcus, manager of HCVN, and her handsome young man staff member, Matt, and using this present day video, this program is being brought to you. Lou is going to tell us that it does take a lot of planning, time, and talent to run a successful operation, such as the Minnesota North Stars, and make it all work out. To start off, he's going to give us some background information about himself. Well, I'm from uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. I came here in 1959. I was uh, I had some thoughts about being a dentist at that time, and uh, one of the schools that combined an excellent dental uh, school with a good hockey program was Minnesota. And so I accepted a scholarship here in 59, and I studied uh, pre-dent subjects for a year, but I decided at that time that I really was more cut out for the business world and dentistry, and I made a switch into marketing and graduated in 63 from Minnesota. Uh, are your parents still living in Sault Ste. Marie? No, uh, uh, neither of my folks are living, but the, my uh, brother and sister are still living there. Our, our family was from there, and my wife's family's from there, so uh, her mom is still living. She's back there also. But uh, since 1962, when my wife and I got married, we've made uh, Minneapolis our home, and this is uh, some place that we've become very fond of, and I became an American in 1967, and we had no plans of going back. You did graduate, though, from high school in Sault Ste. Marie? Right. And about what year was that, Lou? 1959. I finished uh, at Sioux Collegiate. We talk about what, he, what brought Lou to Minnesota from Canada. He tells us a great snow story. Well, uh, I was looking, as I said, for a good dental school and, uh, and a good uh, uh, hockey program, but I also wanted to go somewhere where I thought that uh, there was going to be less snow, believe it or not. I'm, <laughs> I'm from an area that averages around 150 inches a year. Is that right? <laughs> First thing I asked the cab driver was, how much snow do you have here? And, and the cab driver says, three inches. I said, three inches a year? He said, yeah, I'm still looking for that cab driver. <laughs> Lou followed up on some comments a former classmate of his made. Well, I talked to a former classmate of yours, and he said you had a radio, TV, and speech class uh, at the same time. And uh, he said, Lou, that you learned to speak English after you came to the university. Is that right? Yeah, I spoke Canadian till then. <laughs> <laughs> well, something else that he said, that you were always so well-liked, and, and that you're a self-made man, the kind that could always pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And I'm not sure just what that expression meant, but I do take it as a compliment. Well, we've been very fortunate. Uh, we've been able to live where we want to live, been able to uh, uh, play professional hockey, and that was one of our goals in life. Anybody growing up in Canada that played hockey always had an ob objective of being in the National Hockey League. So I was very fortunate doing that, and I did a lot of other things around here that uh, were really a great deal of fun, met uh, so many nice people, and, and we just, you know, been very fortunate. People, uh, as you know, uh, I was seem much happier doing what they want to do if they get that opportunity, but a lot of people don't. And, well, and then, it, then it doesn't become a job, you know. It's just something you work at, and it's it's part of uh, your way of life, and, and you don't look at it as a tedious 
uh, thing you have to do daily, and I've been always able to do that, not only with hockey, but in the business world. I've had uh, opportunities and employment and things I like to do and with people I like to do them with, and so I've been very lucky. He spoke about meeting his wife and gives us family information. She was 12 when I first met her, and I was 14, and uh, when I was the, they moved in the neighborhood. And, and uh, Did the romance start to blossom back then? Yeah, as soon as I could teach her English. She, she didn't speak English at the time. She was French, and when I first met her, she couldn't talk English, so I had to talk to her mom and have her translate when I first asked her out. That. But, well, that uh, was an interesting courtship. It was, but... Uh, was it a very long courtship, yeah. or...? Well, we went together for seven years and then got married. Uh, after, when I saw that I, I was going to finish uh, college in my senior year, I was right on time, and, and she could come down and work for the year, and so it worked out quite well. John Mariucci acted as her sponsor to get her into the country, and, and she got a job that summer, and we were able to, uh, you know, make things meet, uh, ends meet. Uh, pretty tough when you're going to college being married, but she was able to work and I had a scholarship and, and I was able to <coughs> graduate right on time. So right after I graduated, I started working because we ran out of money at that time. <laughs> well, you presently do live in Edina, I believe, and you're the parents of four children? Right. We have a girl that uh, was married this summer. She married a soccer player, as a matter of fact, Tino Letteri, who's a soccer player and, and a striker's team here. And we have twin boys, one of which graduated from St. Uh, Thomas College this uh, past summer in finance, and our other son, Michael, fellow who was involved in the accident uh, four years ago is studying uh, to be a doctor so he'll finish up this quarter at the University of Minnesota and then he's going to enter either medical school or dental school. He's torn between the two. But, well, uh, good. And our youngest son is going to be a sophomore and plays at the University of Minnesota. Made some interesting comments about his son Marty who is also a hockey player. Well now um, I heard somebody, uh, a radio commentator, ask you about do you have a son, Marty? Or yeah, it's Marty. Marty's the one who plays at the University of Minnesota. And uh, he was asking if at some time you were looking forward to him being a part of your team, and you had a sort of an interesting uh, answer to that question. Like, has he been already scouted and maybe Yeah, Marty's approached? been drafted by Chicago Blackhawks. Oh, that was and, what he said. Yeah, and, 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 he, and he was asking if we would draft him, and I said, no, I don't think it's uh, a thing to do. It's not a comfortable situation for players in a locker room to sit around with your son there if they want to call me a complete jerk or something, they might, uh, you know, not feel they got the freedom to do I it. I can't imagine anybody back. calling you a complete oh, yeah. jerk, Lou. <laughs> There'll be a lot of them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you got to allow the players an atmosphere in which they feel that they can work and express their feelings and in and, and, and a trusting atmosphere. And I think that it might have uh, hampered it had Marty uh, been in our organization anyway. So he I wants to play hockey, and we're happy he was drafted by Chicago. <laughs> Gary Bergman passes to Jude Drouin, center ice. Drouin crosses the blue line and feeds Lou Nanny. In alone, Nanny shoots and scores! The ice level replay shows Lou Nanny slipping his shot between the legs of goalie Gilbert, and the North Stars tie the game at 2-2, just 12 seconds after the Boston goal by Orr. I had mentioned that I uh, heard it was the dream of every Canadian boy to become a great athlete, with throngs of admirers cheering him on as he did a slap shot into the net of a beaten goalie. And I said to Lou, maybe, maybe that was his dream. It was my dream, not part of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, As I said, it's all I could think of uh, as I was a youngster. And in those days, uh, there was no TV when I was growing up. TV didn't come come around until uh, about 10 years later in Canada. We were in northern Ontario, and it was a pretty tough place to reach for a television station or a television signal. So all you would uh, get was a radio, and every Saturday night you'd listen to Hockey Night in Canada, and, and you just picture yourself as a member of uh, one of the teams in the National League playing. And, and those are the kind of things that... Uh, you know, you can remember far back wishing that someday you'd be lucky enough to play. And, and as I said, I was very fortunate that I was. Lou had memories of a long career and how much he enjoyed it. Well, you did have a fine playing uh, career. You played with the uh, United States team in the 1968 Olympics. I imagine there's some fond memories about that. Well, that's one of the greatest thrills I ever had, if not the greatest. Uh, I, I was able to get my citizenship in 1967, the fall of 67, right before training camp started. And, and uh, then 68, we had the Olympics in Grenoble, and, and being a part of the Olympics and taking part for your country is entirely different than playing uh, in a competitive uh, league just because it's professional. I mean, there's a different atmosphere, a different feeling, and uh, 
things are looked at differently, but it, it was uh, undoubtedly as fine a memory as I've had in professional athletics, and it's something that I treasure, and I believe that anybody gets the opportunity to participate in the Olympics should take it. Lou was the only player with the North Stars in all of its first 11 years of existence. Played mostly defense. Now, yeah. So you started in what year, Lou? I started uh, right after the Olympics, 67-68 uh, season. I came after Grenoble and I started uh, at the end of the first year. And, and that career lasted until? Well, uh, I, I played until uh, February 10th of 78 when uh, uh, they made a change here in administration and management and I was playing one day and I was a general manager and coach the next so well that was for a while that was <laughs> interesting um, you played mostly mostly defense wasn't it when right you were I had two years of forward basically a year and a half to two years where I was moved up to right wing but overall uh, I played uh, defense uh, as my position and uh, I, I guess I'd have to say I enjoyed either position wherever it was it's just a fun thing to do and be able to play it he did have injuries. I've had, I've had uh, a lot of injuries. I've had uh, knee ligament operation, uh, three shoulder separations, broke my nose about six, seven times, and I had about 300 stitches and cracked ankle, broken wrist, and oh my calcium goodness. in the hip. So I've had a few things that uh, have gone wrong. But uh, well, that's always a big worry for a player, I imagine, and for the coach well, you, too. Really, you don't think about it. If you, you think don't. about it, that's when you get hurt. Uh, you just, uh, you just play the game, and when you get hurt, you heal. I asked him about superstitions. I have too many to name, Maxie, and that's uh, one thing that I'd like to try and forget, but I can't. <laughs> Even in management, I've got them. It's something, I don't call them superstitions. I call them uh, forms of, uh, of uh, easing your mind, uh, and relaxing your mind. In other words, becoming at ease with what you've got to do because everything you feel you have to do to get ready for a game has been done. <laughs> I, but they, they really are tedious and they're numerous and... I, I think try to I cut them off, but I haven't been able to. All of us have something. I still think I dread to have a black cat walk in front of me and those things, you know, that have been with yeah. us since childhood. All of those accomplishments themselves make him worthy of this award. But one more very special item on his long list of achievements makes his career so unique. Beginning in 1964 and for most of the 50 seasons since, he has been part of the broadcasting of perhaps the greatest singular celebration of our game here in the state of hockey the Minnesota State High School Hockey Tournament. Wild fans, please join us in honoring Lou Nanny. Lou is accompanied by his wife, Francine. Once again, let's hear it for the 2014 State of Hockey Legacy Award recipient, Lou Nanny. Lou Nanny was given many, many awards. Well, you've won some coveted awards. I know the Tom Dill Memorial Cup and the Stargazers Club Award, and that's just to name a couple. I'm sure there have been many, many more tributes and honors, and uh, I know you earned them all. Well, I, as I said, it's just a lot of fun to be able to play a professional sport because uh, when you look at it, as a kid, you do it for fun. So all of a sudden you get older and they start paying you for it. That's it's almost incredulous that someone could be getting paid for something that they'd be happy to do for nothing. And I'm sure a lot of times people think I should have been doing it for nothing. But <laughs> oh, oh, no. Well, in addition to being general manager, you're also a vice president, and you're one of Minnesota's alternate members of the National Hockey League Board of Governors. And to show the respect, Lou, that you've earned from your peers, uh, you chair the General Managers Committee of the National Hockey League. No doubt you are the most recognized hockey figure in the state. There was quite a variety of nationalities that made up the team, and I had asked Lou how the American hockey players compared to the players from Europe and other countries. One question, or one thing I wanted to mention to you, Lou, I'm amazed at the number of Canadian players that are presently with the North Stars. I, there must be 16 or more. I tried to count them up. In the... Oh, no, there aren't. Uh, there oh? aren't 16. You probably counted a few Europeans that we got. We got the, we've got Czechs, we've got Finns, we've got, there'd be 16 if we counted all in our organization, but we've got, we had the most Americans in the National Hockey League on the team last year. Was that we right? We had seven of those, and we've got uh, a Czech and Muso, we've got two Finns, we've got Grandstrand and Taco that are Finnish, and so we've got that conglomeration you know, of nations, but uh, we don't care where they're from as long as they can play. And right. That, that's, that's what you look for. That's is the their bottom line. Is, so. Are they able to, to perform, and how well can they perform for you? 
I was surprised when I saw in your record book that Willie Platt was born in Paraguay, South America, but then I read on a little bit and see that he did migrate to uh, Canada with his parents at an early age, so that became home to him. But, uh, well, what about the American kids? Can they skate as good? This is an unfair question asking you, but uh, can they skate as good as the Canadian players, do you think? Well, well if you look at Neil Broughton, he had over 100 points last year, and, and there are very few people, you can name one hand, that... Uh, that uh, get 100 points a year. He's American. Rod Langway's American. He won the uh, top defensive trophy in the league, the Norris Trophy, two years ago. Uh, Tom Barrasso is American. He was the top goaltender in the league two years ago. So uh, Bobby Carpenter is an American. He got over 50 goals uh, in Washington. There, there's no doubt about the ability of the American hockey player. And because of the programs being developed throughout the country, especially in the northern part of the United States, We've seen a vast increase in the number of players uh, drafted in, from the United States and the number of players playing in the National Hockey League. And now, you know, we don't look at American Canadian or anything. It's just a commonplace thing right now. Lou had an interesting, intriguing story to tell about smuggling out of Europe a young Latvian player who wanted to defect to the United States and play for the North Stars. He wasn't having any success doing that. So, Lou and a corporate officer went to Europe and kidnapped the young man. They did this by stuffing him into the trunk of their rental car and taking the big risk of getting him over the border. There were some anxious moments since this plan consisted of buying a lot of girly magazines, cartons of cigarettes, boxes of candy and handing them out to the young guards. Well, it worked because these young male guards, they were more interested in the contraband and then checking the car. So they just waved them right across the border. That sounds like such a story of intrigue. It almost seems like a book could be written, how you did sort of whisk them out of the country onto a plane and to London and onto the Concorde to the flight back to New York. Were there some anxious moments on your part? Well, the only anxious moments were the unknown. One, was he going to be watched by anyone? We didn't know if he was. Like their hockey team, when they travel, they're always watched. And uh, and we knew that uh, the Czechoslovakian people knew that we'd been after him for four years. And uh, secondly, uh, there were anxious moments when we couldn't find him. He was... Uh, we were supposed to meet in Zagreb, and he'd already been there a few hours before, and he was turned away to consulate. Then he went to Belgrade, and we tried to find him there, and he'd already been turned away, and we couldn't find him. And his visa was running up in four days, so oh. we, were, we were getting uh, concerned, but uh, fortunately it all worked out. We did talk about the difference in the young player's salary playing with the North Stars. Playing in Latvia, he was paid $18 a game. and got paid only if the team won. Lou made some very interesting remarks about this fellow's amazement in adjusting to the American way of life. Well, I'm sure that he's a, a fine young man, and, and how has he been doing in your uh, exhibition or practice uh, games? Do you feel he's coming around and adjusting to the American way of life? I don't think he's had much problem. He's leading our team in scoring penalty minutes and shots on goal, so <laughs> he's fitting rather nicely. Uh, one thing that I did enjoy, Lou, was his amazement at our instant cash machines. Apparently, they don't have anything like that at home. <laughs> and from Big Macs to, uh, to Cadillacs to, uh, in the American, too, that I enjoyed that headline in the paper. Well, he has an infectious smile and such a happy nature. I'm sure he's a pleasant fellow to have around. Well, the risk that Lou took getting the young man across the border paid off for the North Stars because he was a big draw for the team. He was just one of many outstanding international players that did play with the North Stars over the years. Lou spoke of meeting a lot of wonderful young men. And well, you've met a lot of wonderful young men, and the uppermost in their mind has been playing hockey and playing it good, and I know you've been an inspiration to them, uh, Lou, because you came up through the ranks and, and learned uh, the hard way. You know what they're going through, and I, I know that you support them 100% when they're out there giving their all. Well, that's right. We, uh, as we said, we are very fortunate to be able to play a sport, and especially uh, for some of us that like hockey best, we, we think it's even an added bonus because it, it's an exciting game even to practice. And, and when you got something like that, it makes it fun to go to work every day. I asked him what he felt or should be done at the youth level. Well, uh, 
the biggest thing to promote hockey is giving everybody the opportunity to play it. As I said, hockey to us is the most fun game to play. So wherever you can get kids uh, the availability of ice and, and skates and sticks, that's going to promote it more than anything because it is a sport that it really infectious. It gets uh, in the kid's blood and, and it's all they want to do is skate and play. And So now if you're enabling kids that don't have the opportunity to play, and there are a lot in the state, we just take it for granted, but there are a lot of places where they don't have ice or they don't have equipment because it is a, an expensive sport to play. If you give them the opportunity to play, that alone is going to be the biggest boon because uh, they find places and ways to play after they, they get caught up in it. And uh, secondly, they've got to have the exposure in, uh, in playing the game so that they're able to play for longer periods of time against better competition and, uh, and people watching that will, will encourage them and, and, and as they do that, the sport is going to grow at the grassroots level. Another question that I asked was, did he think there would ever be another league the size of the NHL. With the large number of high school and college players, only a handful ever make it to the big league to play. Well, that's the same in football, basketball, or any major sport. It's the same in corporate business today. There's only a handful of CEOs. And if you look at it, everything gets funneled down and the cream comes to the, tro uh, to the top. And now with the failure of the USFL and their suit against the NFL, it's really unrealistic to think that someone's going to be able to, to get up enough money to start a, a league and then if it doesn't work out, they're going to sue another league to get support to, to be uh, merged into that league. And on top of it, more so than anything else, we don't have the areas in the country, in this country especially. Canada hasn't got the population to sustain any more uh, National Hockey League teams, maybe one at the most. And we in the States don't have the uh, facilities and we don't have the regions that aren't hit. Yeah, there are places like Dallas, Seattle, and Atlanta where they have buildings, but they don't have people that know the game. So hockey would have a tough time being successful unless they had programs at the grassroots level on up where they build so that they can develop enough fan support to support a, a team. So right now you don't have a place where another hockey league can go and start up and be successful at it at a major league level and, and pay the kind of dollars that would can attract these kids. We talked about the big responsibility of running a smooth operation. It fell on Lou's shoulders. And he seemed to enjoy it. It required a lot of travel. Well, I'm very accustomed to it. I do travel a great deal. I, uh, I probably am on an airplane more than stewardesses are every month uh, because uh, they only have to go about 18 days. And I think uh, during the hockey season, I'm on airplanes more than that. But it's part of the job. I'm a good traveler. I, I like it. I have no problem uh, traveling. And, and it's something that I've become very accustomed to throughout my life. And, uh, that's uh, probably a boon rather than, than a burden for me because uh, I enjoy going to different cities. I, I have friends all across the United States and Canada, and, I, and it's, uh, it's a fun part of the job, I think. Lou emphasized that he did not make rash decisions. There were many hard decisions to make, especially when cutting the roster. He emphasized the fact that he learned the hard way from the ground up. You have some tough decisions to be made, and I bet one of the hardest is when you have to make the cuts in the roster. Well, you do, but that's what we get paid for. Uh, I always say there's, if you're going to make good money, you're going to have to have uh, some tough uh, decisions to make. If you look at it, you got, if you got uh, a lot of pressure, you get a lot of dollars. If you get no pressure, you get no dollars. So uh, I'll take the, the opportunity to withstand the pressure and, and make our decisions. Those are things that come with the territory, and the toughest part is having to, to cut kids that always aspire to play in the National Hockey League and on top of that they make significantly different money between here and the minor leagues and so that that is tough but uh, as we said nothing good comes easy and and uh, people have been through it before and they'll be through it after and it's something that has to be done. His hospitality is second to none. Playing his team so far has been fun. He's been kind and generous almost to a fault. Unfortunately the time has come to bring it to a halt. <laughs> He's known around the league as Sweet Lou from the Sioux, but if we win the game tonight, you'll really be in a stew. During the interview, Lou spoke about his love of the game. He said he received a lot of body checks, but he gave out a few himself. <laughs> yeah, that's part of the game. That's part of the game that I enjoyed. The body checking it makes the game uh, an exciting game because contact is uh, a basis for exciting hockey. And, and when you learn to, to hit well, there's a technique to it. Uh, you, 
you get uh, when you're a defenseman, you get as much satisfaction out of throwing a good body check as some people do scoring a goal. And, and can you walk off the floor and, and shake hands afterwards and be pretty good friends? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you can because you've given the check out. You feel pretty good about it. <laughs> I'm going to wind up the program now with remarks that Lou made about our city of Hutchinson and friends that he had in the area at that time. A lot of my good friends out around Hutchinson, Litchfield area. I had a farm in Litchfield for five years while I was playing, and Leroy Barrick uh, took care of my horses for many years in Hutchinson, so I, I uh, haven't got to see people like uh, Leroy and uh, Gilbreth, uh, David Gilbreth over in, uh, uh, I mean, G Gabrielson over in Litchfield for quite a while, and it's tough when you're, when you're traveling, you never get to see some of these people, but it's... Well, nice. we'll say, say hello, hello to them by yeah, means well, I, of the airwaves. I've enjoyed this time spent with you, and I hope you have enjoyed it too. I will look forward to the next time. Thanks for tuning in. It's Maxine Amol saying bye for now.